looking for our instructor, uh, Lieutenant Taylor. Could you tell us where to find him? That's him up there. Thompson, sir. We were told to report to you. Oh, good morning. Glad to know you. You men all checked in? Yes, sir. Do you have any free time right now? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll stow this gear and meet you in the ready room in ten minutes. Thank you, sir. Bye. See, that's Bob Taylor. I've seen him in pictures. Now, you won't have to worry about that until you get to sea stage. You sure gave it the works up there, sir. You suppose we'll ever be able to do that, sir? Oh, sure you will. I know how you feel. I remember how I felt when I was right where you fellows are, just starting primary training. Hasn't been too long ago, either. Yeah, I know how it is. You joined the Navy because you wanted to fly. But instead of flying, pretty soon you found yourself doing things that didn't seem to have any connection with flying. What you didn't realize was that the obstacle course, for example, had been carefully planned to increase your agility. The hours of boxing and wrestling you put in gave you an aggressiveness that every Navy pilot must have. You probably couldn't see what swimming had to do with flying. Being able to swim might someday save your life. Marching was just a preliminary to the air discipline you would ultimately experience in formation flying. Then, for recreation, you'd hike 15 or 20 miles. Plenty tough going, you thought, but being able to take it in stride might someday mean your survival after a jungle crack-up. Studied bed making, mathematics, recognition, a lot of other things. There are good reasons for all of them. Perhaps the most important is the fact that the foundation of every naval officer is physical fitness. You have a good memory, sir. Is it really pretty tough, this primary training? Well, if you mean does it take hard work, yes. But if you mean is flying itself tough, no. When you get the, the right approach, flying is relatively simple. Because the airplane is of value only as a platform. Some are platforms for guns. Some are platforms for bombs. For depth charges. Or torpedoes. Some carry men and equipment. Some are for observation. Just as a battleship is merely a convenient floating platform, so the airplane is a convenient airborne platform. Take the carrier pilot, for instance. Flying's only a small part of his job. He has to get his plane safely to his objective. To do this, he has to navigate correctly. And even if he's pretty good at it, that's almost a full-time job in itself. He must stand a 360-degree watch at all times. An enemy plane may shoot him down before he even sees it. He must watch the ocean for enemy ships. When he reaches his objective, he must deliver his blow at the enemy and at the same time keep himself and his plane from being shot up. safely, perhaps all alone. He must backtrack on his own navigation, 
aiming at a tiny moving speck in thousands of miles of open ocean. There isn't enough gas for second guessing. And all the while, he must be on the alert for attacking enemy planes. But what I've always wondered is, how can he do all that and fly the plane too? Because the combat pilot handles the mechanics of flying as easily and as naturally as, as you handle the mechanics of walking. The senses are so keenly developed and so attuned to the airplane that he can, he can fly with 90% of his attention on something else. Still know exactly what his plane's doing all the time. That's what the cadet has to learn to do before he can become a combat pilot. Look at those F6S. That's for me. Primary training, you don't just learn to fly yellow perils learn to fly airplanes, any and everything with wings on it. Because when you can fly the Yellow Peril and fly it well, any other plane is just another kite. The operational planes just have more gadgets with which you have to be familiar. As far as the actual flying goes, the only difference is that the big planes go faster and weigh more. Of course, you fellows probably think of flying as something entirely strange and new. But actually, you've been learning to fly ever since you started learning to walk. Ever notice how babies learn to walk? First, they get interested in their feet, in the mechanics of walking. They don't make much progress. Then one day, they get the complete picture of where they are and where they want to go. They forget all about their feet and really walk. Because they forget about the mechanics of walking and put their minds on the ultimate objective. You were learning to fly when you first learned to ride a scooter. Maybe you didn't know enough to bank the first time you went around a corner, so you fell over on the outside of the curve. Or maybe you banked it too much and fell off on the inside. But after a while, you got so that you could tell by the feel of it whether you were banking right. Well, in flying an airplane, you use that same sense of balance you learned from riding the scooter. You were learning to fly when you learned to ride a bicycle. You added to that sense of balance, of the right feel of the thing when you banked for a turn. You rode with other fellows, maybe. That was formation riding. Not too different from formation flying. If you rode enough, you got the feel of your bicycle, so it was almost a part of you. Like most fellows, you probably drive a car. But can you think back to the day when you first started to learn to drive? Remember how hard it seemed? You wondered if you'd ever be able to jump into the car and drive like the kid next door. You had trouble remembering which gear was which occasionally with almost disastrous results. In a surprisingly short time, you forgot all about the gear shift and the steering wheel, and which pedal was the clutch and which the brake. And as the business of driving became more and more automatic, it was possible to devote most of your attention to matters much more important than the mere mechanics of operating the car. By now, you really had the feel of it. Yes, you've been learning to fly all your life because flying isn't so different from the things you're used to. If it were, Agatha Wright brothers have flown in the first place. Matter of fact, they probably didn't know as much about flying as you fellows do right now. Essentially, there's not such a great difference between driving an automobile and flying a plane. When you're driving a car, you can see ahead of you the road you're going to travel. All you have to do is to follow it. In flying a plane, there is no path for you to follow. Don't let that worry you. You'll soon learn to create that path in your mind, so you see it as clearly in your imagination as you see the highway ahead when you're traveling in an automobile. No matter where you fly or what you want to make your airplane do, your mind will form that mental path ahead to take you safely past obstacles. That mental path will guide you through acrobatic maneuvers, bring you in for well-executed landings. It won't be long after you start your training that you begin thinking ahead. So your path is always out there, planned, well in advance of your plane. You mean you get so you can actually visualize a road up there ahead of you? Yeah, that's what it amounts to. There's nothing so unusual about it, it works on the ground, too. You probably know people who never could learn to park in a tight space. Somebody told them that if they'd start cutting the wheel at a certain spot and then cut it hard the other way and so on, they'd have no trouble. That'd be fine if all parking spaces were of a standard size. Unfortunately, they're not. If he would first look at the space and then visualize the path his car must take to get into that space, he'd have a much better chance of making it on the first try. 
Ever been to one of those motorcycle riding exhibitions they have at carnivals and fairs? Those fellows have to visualize an exact path if they want to go on living. As a matter of fact, they can give you a pretty good exhibition of the wing over. That's one of the acrobatic maneuvers you'll be doing later on. For some reason, a lot of people have the idea that it takes a superman to be a naval aviator. Well, sir, can just anybody learn to fly? Practically any normal person who has all these faculties and some good health. I don't care who you are or what you've been doing things all your life that'll help you with your flying. Take, uh, take stalls and spins, for instance. We've had students come in here with a deathly pair of them. Whereas, actually, they're both perfectly safe and simple maneuvers. <laughs> you just don't want to run into the ground while executing them. As a matter of fact, you're already familiar with some of the symptoms of a stall. You learned about them from your bicycle. When you start up a grade on your bicycle, if you don't pedal, you lose speed. You see the bicycle's going slower. The wind whistling past your ears quiets down. Pretty soon, the bicycle gets wobbly, then stalls, falls over. Same way with an airplane. Pull up into the climbing attitude, and unless you add power, your speed will fall off. If you keep the nose in that climbing attitude, you'll soon begin to sense the same stalling conditions you experienced with your bicycle. You can feel the airplane getting ready to stall. The controls get slack and mushy, don't respond as quickly. The bicycle wobbles, the plane vibrates. Then it stalls, drops off on a wing. In certain cases, it may spin. Of course, one of the best ways to avoid an impending stall in an airplane is to get the nose down. Motorcycle riders use this technique too. If they find they don't have enough speed to maintain their attitude, they put their nose down and pick up whatever speed they need. if improperly flown, will skid through the air in very much the same way that the motorboat skids in the water. On the other hand, the boy falling off his scooter on the inside because he misjudged his turn has his counterpart in the airplane, which slips downward off course because of a poorly flown turn. You see, practically everything you'll do in an airplane is paralleled by something you're already familiar with. But, sir, aren't there instruments in the plane to tell you whether you're banking right in the turn and whether your speed is right and so on? Oh, yes, the instruments are there, all right. And the time will come when they're all important. Many times your life will depend on your instruments. You'll be able to fly through weather so thick you can't see your wingtips. And yet you'll get there safely because of instruments. In situations like that, your instruments will act as a sort of substitute for your sense of sight. But it isn't practical to use substitutes for your eyes until you've learned to use your eyes themselves in flying. For instance, either of you fellows ever had a motorcycle? I did. As a matter of fact, I still do at home. Does it have a speedometer on it? Yes, sir. Well, when you're going uphill, do you watch the speedometer to see that you're going fast enough to keep from stalling? Why, no, sir. Oh, I suppose you're going downhill. There's a bad intersection at the bottom. You don't want to get going so fast you can't stop in case a car comes along. Do you watch the speedometer to be sure you don't get going too fast? No, sir. Well, then how do you tell whether you're going too fast or not? Oh, well, you just know, that's all. How? Oh. Well, sir, by how fast things seem to be going by. Yeah, and how the wind sounds in your ears. Just by the way it feels, I guess. <laughs> sure. By sight, sound, and feel, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's how you learn to fly an airplane. As a primary student, when you're learning to land a plane, you'll be so busy trying to keep a straight course and your wings level, trying to judge just when and where to set her down, you won't have time to move your eyes down into the cockpit. You'll have to judge your airspeed by sight, sound, and feel. And the sooner you learn to do that, the sooner you'll learn to make good landings. But even before that, you'll have to learn how to use your eyes correctly. Well, sir, how do you mean? How should we use them? Maybe I can show you. Now, I can stand here and look straight ahead at that radio and still see the writing on this blackboard over here more than 100 degrees away. I can't read the writing, but I can still see there's writing there. Over on this side, I can see there's someone sitting on that couch. I can't tell who it is or whether he's asleep. From his attitude, it looks like it. Let's go over to the board. Oh, 
How much you see depends almost entirely on how you use your eyes. Now, the average person standing here looking at the radio would see the radio and would probably be conscious of objects within this range. But training will increase your ability to use your entire field of vision so that eventually you get to the point where you're conscious of objects and movement within this range, even including an area slightly back of your eyes. So you can cover something like 210 of the 360 degrees. So you see it's a matter of divided attention. You have to learn to be conscious of several things at once, of your entire field of vision. The natural tendency is to concentrate your vision on a single object. And the minute you concentrate your attention too much on one thing, you're narrowing your vision, blotting out everything else. You're doing to yourself exactly what you do to a horse when you put blinders on it. That's one of the principal causes of automobile accidents. The driver gets his gaze fixed on some one thing. He stares at it so narrows his vision that he loses all sense of the relationship of his car to the road. The expert driver keeps his gaze moving, moving all the time. He spots a car just behind him. While he may not look directly at it again, he's conscious that it's there. He glances at that intersection with a car approaching. While his gaze moves elsewhere, still that car is within his full field of vision, so that he never actually loses sight of it. To some degree, a good driver develops his sense of sight instinctively. In a good pilot, it must be developed to a very high degree. But sight alone isn't enough. One of the first things you'll learn when you start to fly is to hold the plane in straight and level flight. At first, that'll seem like a pretty hard job. The nose will wander up, or it'll wander down. You'll think you're in level attitude lots of times when you're actually climbing or gliding. But you'll soon find several ways of knowing the attitude of your plane. You'll know by the way the nose looks in relation to the horizon. Or by the way the wings look. You'll know by the sound of the engine. When you're in level flight, it'll probably sound something like this. But pull the nose up, you'll hear the difference. You hear it? You can tell it's working harder. On the other hand, put the nose down. You hear the engine speed up. It sounds too fast. Also, you can tell a lot about what your plane's doing by combining your senses of sight and sound with the way the airplane feels to you. The feel of the controls and that seat of the pants feeling flyers sometimes talk about. Suppose you want to put your plane into a glide. Cut the throttle and push your nose down. How far do you push it? You learn to push it down until your eyes tell you it's right for a glide. Till the whistle of the wind through the strut sounds right. Till the glide feels right to you. The nose starts to wander up, the sound of the wind will change. The wings and nose won't look right for a glide in relation to the horizon. Just know that something's wrong. Old time pilots will say you feel that something's wrong. But they actually mean a combination of all three senses sight, sound, and feel. Learning to fly the way we want you to learn is a little like, like learning to type by the touch system. The old fashioned way of learning to type was by looking at the copy you're typing from and then at the keyboard to see which keys to hit. That way you must pay attention to both the copy and the keyboard. So you never can become very fast or very efficient. The correct way to learn is to forget about the keyboard entirely by blanking out the keys and referring when necessary to a chart. Soon you're hitting the right keys without thinking about them. Your attention remains on the copy all the time. Your fingers find the right keys automatically. Likewise, in learning to fly, if you try to control the attitude of your plane by looking in the cockpit, you give your eyes two jobs to do. Then see what's going on outside the cockpit, and must watch the instruments, too. Later on, you'll be able to so divide your attention that this will be possible. But in the meantime, too much attention to what's going on inside the cockpit will cut your efficiency. Your landings won't be so good. 
you can't watch the attitude of the plane, the relationship of plane to ground and horizon and all the other things you should be seeing, and keep your eyes on the instrument panel as well. for you to fly figure eights around the pylons. It takes too long for you to get your eyes from the general pattern to the instruments and back again. You have more trouble with acrobatics, simply because you're trying to watch two things at once. So naturally, you don't do as well. The well-trained pilot keeps his attention out of the cockpit. He handled the mechanics of flying as easily and as effortlessly as the touch system typist handles the mechanics of typing. He sits relaxed in his cockpit, relaxed but alert. His touch on the controls is as light but yet as firm as the touch of a doctor taking a patient's pulse. He's always aware of the general pattern of the ground beneath him. He makes mental notes of all fields or roads where he might be able to land in case of emergency. Formation, he is continually conscious of the position of planes flying with him. He's always on the lookout for other planes in the area. And once he spots them, he keeps track of them as long as they're anywhere near him. He's like the basketball player. The mechanics of handling the ball, of the dribbling, are automatic. He sees the entire court. He's aware of the position of the opposition players and his own team. He constantly sees the whole picture. Actually, the Finnish pilot and his airplane operate as a single unit. The designer of the bicycle didn't plan a two-wheeled vehicle and then decide it would be nice if somebody rode on it. He began with the rider and built the bicycle around him. Likewise, the early designers of the airplane didn't start out by designing a flying machine and then putting a man in it. They started with the man himself and tried to put wings on him so that he could fly like a bird. To the trained aviator of today, the controls of the modern airplane are merely an extension of his own arms and legs. As much a part of him as the wings are part of a bird. When you want to walk from one place to another, you don't have to stop and figure out every movement of your feet and your legs, nor do you consciously decide on an exact path. All that's automatic. And when you can learn to fly an airplane, or learn to make a landing, or shoot a circle, or do a slow roll, or a snap roll, and execute them all with the same effortless ease with which you walk or a bird flies, then you and the airplane will truly have become one, an efficient, coordinated unit. And you will have achieved the purpose of primary flight. And will be well on your way toward becoming a United States Naval Aviator.